Now this passage in Isaiah 53 is traditionally associated with Jesus, and that becomes particularly obvious when we get to this passage, he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Right, so that, I think everyone could recognize that this, he was bruised for our iniquities. Well, the gospels cite this passage in particular. So is this a physical description of, of God? Um, probably not exactly, but it would give us reason to think that it wasn't the physical beauty of God, like Jesus wasn't physically attractive per se. I don't think that's what this passage is saying, per se. But rather that we saw nothing attractive in him. Human beings did not see him and think there is goodness, beauty, and truth personified in that man. When his enemies looked upon him, they saw somebody they despised. They hated him. When it says the we, when we shall see him, there's no beauty. From our vantage point, it doesn't mean there isn't any, but from our perspective, we see the cross. Do we love the cross? No, but that's the way, that's his way. Remember I talked about the Via Crucis, the way of the cross, a few classes ago? Um, to answer my own question, there is no physical description of Jesus at all in the Bible. Um, we know he's a man. Uh, we know he's a Jew. We know he was circumcised on the eighth day. Right? So we know that he was a man. Um, we know that he was, he spoke at his bar mitzvah at the age of 12 in the temple. Uh, we know that he was crucified about the age of 33. But that's about it. We have no physical description aside from those small details. And those small details are just simply there sh to show that he's an individual human being, among other things. Because to be an individual human being is to be either a male or a female. That's one of the things, actually that's the physical mark that distinguishes an, one individual from another and shows us that we're not all the same. There's something distinct about a man as opposed to a woman. You can see it, that's, but that's the only physical sign. Of a, of a distinct individual. The sign almost is insignificant, but it does show that this is not exactly the same as somebody else, right? Remember, go back to the definition back in Genesis 1, 26. In the image of God created he him, male and female he created, the, he, created he them, right? So there's an individual there, whether they're a woman or a man, it's an individual and they bear the image of God. But we don't know what he physically looks like. And so a definition of human nature that is based on physical characteristics or identity group characteristics uh, is irrelevant to understanding human nature. It's not that it's not there. It's not that we don't judge on the basis of it, but it's not the thing that unites us. It's the thing that divides us. Is this, have I got this right now? I can't remember. No, it's not. It's Ephesians, is it? No, also not. Ha! What is it? Never mind. Um, neither male nor female, slave nor free, Greek nor Scythian, right? Galatians, Galatians. yes. Thank you. But all are one in Christ Jesus. So what unifies them? It's God. But those, what we call identity group characteristics or the physical characteristics that make us different from one another, those are not the grounds of unity. They're not the thing that marks human nature understood as Christians. It doesn't, it's, it's off topic. It misses the point. Boethius' definition that we are individual substance of a rational nature is a common definition. And by means of reasoning and words, we can come to a common mind. Because reality conforms to reasoning and speech. 
What happens though when speech and rationality can say that two plus two equals five? Well, for one thing, we now have clear propaganda rather than science or knowledge. But for another, we're saying that language and reality conforms to whatever we say it means. It's power over words. It's power over nature. It's power over other human beings. You need to look at this up sometime, the definition of a person. Very important in our day. Uh, this is the primary assault of our age when we're being reduced to the sum total of our identity group characteristics and then thrown into an algorithm where you can be identified by a number. His prism, there's the panopticon. Back to the text. Comments or questions? I like this story because it sort of gives us the big picture. And he says, a surveillance is happening by means of a helicopter. Helicopter skimmed down between the roofs, hovered for an instant like a blue bottle fly, and darted away again with a curving flight. It was the police patrol snooping into pe people's windows. The patrols did not matter, however, only the thought police mattered. Um, now, what we find at the beginning, and this is what makes Winston Smith our, our hero, is that Winston Smith is unhappy with this reality. He's not contented, and he's rebelling. How is his rebellion manifested? Well, he has a, a pen, ink, and a journal. He's writing his own private thoughts on a piece of paper or in a in a book, and he does it in a little corner in his flat. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer though, as he well knew, even a bat can be revealing. A kilometer away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and white above the, gr the grimy landscape. This he thought with a vague, sort of vague distaste. This was London, chief city of airstrip one, itself the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that should tell him whether London had always been quite like this. Were there always these vistas of rotting 19th century houses, their sides shored up with blocks of timber, their windows patched with cardboard, and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, so the city basically, literally, in, in such a state of disrepair that it's, it's collapsing on itself. Was it always like this? He can't even remember. And this is one of the reasons that he's writing down. It's to remember thoughts that are being daily contradicted by what other people are saying. And this will be a, a history record for himself. He's not planning on publishing this. It's to preserve his sanity when everyone's telling him that black is white and that freedom is slavery and that uh, War is peace. And he feels like his humanity is slipping away from him. Writing something down will be a way of retaining his, his own sanity, his own, the word sanity refers to health, by the way. And it's based on rationality. Is it, does what he thinks the reality is conform to a reality that everybody else can see for themselves and verify and discuss it and reason about it and come up with, no, that can't be it, that's false. What they say is true isn't true because we can discuss it and rationally demonstrate that it contradicts itself. War is not peace. That's, that's plainly false. If that's not false, then there is no truth. Right? If things that are actually antonyms are, t are held to be synonyms, then logic is impossible and living in reality is impossible or it is just whatever they say. And Winston Smith is not willing to accept that. 
because he's old enough to remember when things were different and actually better. There's his problem. Things used to be better than they are now. And the party tells me that things are getting better every day, but that's only because they control speech and the account of history. And that's what actually what Winston Smith does. He goes into the Ministry of Truth and he rewrites history so that it fits what the party in power says uh, about their own victories, which are actually defeats. Things are getting worse and worse, but the party says they're better and better. And I'm here to make sure that the party's uh, position is supported by the historical records. So he uses this little corner in his own flat where, the, where he's observed that the telescreen doesn't actually see him. Now he can only go there for a little time because if he stays out of it for too long, they will observe that he's not there. He's in his room, but he's in the corner and that will indicate that he is being disobedient. So he can go there just for a brief period of time. But when he does there, he is clearly doing something that is punishable by death, which they call thought crime. And so here's how how dehumanizing it is, it's not only that your actions can't contravene party dictates, you can't even think things that are against what the party says. Not even allowed to think it. The thought of an alternate reality is punishable by death. So when he comes to write uh, we find that he's not actually sure how old he is. This is part of the disorientation of Orwell's no novel. He doesn't actually remember details about himself so that he knows things that will distinguish Winston Smith from everything going on around him. He's even forgotten how old he is. He thinks it's April 4th, 1984. He thinks it is. He's not sure. Not quite sure how old he is. <laughs> if you think about it, um, one of the ways in which we do give ourselves a sense of historical reality is precisely through memory. Through our own personal history. We have relatives, we have friends, we grow up in certain areas, a very specific place and time. And those are part of our, our own personal identity, right? They would distinguish anyone I'm speaking to from me, e even my wife, even my children. They're distinct from me because they have, they have a different story than I do. There are certain different biographical details. And the, the sum total of those is part of my individual story that will give me a sense of distinction, lived distinction, I'm not just a male, I'm a male that, who was here at this time, this age, these experiences, and those will be part of my distinct humanity, but that doesn't distinguish us per se. Those are sort of incidental as far as a definition of a human being, but still they're important to me. Question here is in terms of civilization, in terms of uh, the greatest possible good for the greatest number of people, can a civilization make progress if it doesn't know its own identity? If it has no historical memory? If it has nothing about it that is considered to be part of its definition? such that it, it's this and not that? Or is it a definition that's so inclusive that you could put whatever you want into it and there would be no contradiction? The internet and the algorithms which work through binary code effectively eliminate the distinctions of time and space. That's what gives them their power, right? You can do it through your smartphone. You can 
zoom to somebody on the other side of the world. Great power to transcend distances. And you'll see a visual image of yourself. But what it doesn't show is all of the distinctives that make you you. It's not just your appearance, it's your, your history. All the acts that you did. All the thoughts that you've had, all the feelings that you've had in relation to other people, all those things that you regard as important to who you are. The people you've loved and the people you've hated and those sorts of things. Those are part of who you, what makes you, you. But from the vantage point of the panopticon where Big Brother conforms reality in accordance with his use of language, where two plus two equals five, you start to lose the sense of the importance of your own personal history. Because it's Big Brother who's going to tell you what words mean, not you. You don't get to write your own journal. So this is part of the dehumanization. So he's not sure of himself when he was born, but he's actually not sure of anything. And that was the explicit intention of the party. It wanted to systematically erase the past and uh, the memory of it and replace it with whatever it wanted to show how wonderful the party was. Did you know that right now in Britain they're proposing to save the planet from global warming to go back to rationing. It's just a proposal, but they, these are like trial balloons to see what the public opinion is on these things. When we go to back to rationing. So the wealth that you've enjoyed, the property you have, the freedoms that you've possessed, what if we take those away for a time and just see what happens? Will people go along with this? Will they say that they were safer? Will they believe that they were safer as a result of that? Will they accept the limitations on their ability to travel or congregate with whom when they desire? Will they accept that? And if they do, maybe we can also present it as a way of Another good, which first good is to save us from the imminent disa disaster of death by a microscopic disease, a virus. But here we can save a, a, for a bigger cause, save the planet. Will you accept that? Well, here we have a process where a whole new language has been developed to present that reality persuasively, it's called newspeak. It's not the news, it's newspeak. It's, it's using new terms. And what they are trying to do is write a new dictionary that will get rid of old words and bring in new words. The current practice of dead naming is exactly this with respect to identity. You can't call me that name because that's the old identity and it's illegal, or it, you ought not to be able to say this, because now it's that, and I say that it is so. Uh, in Orwell's 1984, this is a process that's going to take quite a while. It's not gonna happen until 2050. That new speak, the new dictionary will come in and all the old words will be gone, and they won't mean anything anymore. In fact, they will be uh, no longer, the words won't be known. So it's a slow process of taking language and a tradition that is connected with language that, that, by the way, think about what language is and what it does. Obviously communicate, right? Have you ever thought about how, how it's possible to communicate through language? How is that even possible? Like, how does it work? You can hear me speaking. You hear noises coming out of my mouth. If you speak English, you might understand what I'm saying. If you don't, then you probably have a Google translator that'll translate it for you into another language anyway. But it requires you to hear the sound. 
So it requires a couple of things. It requires me to have a word in my mind first, which then I articulate with my tongue, my mouth. And then it makes a noise. And the noise goes out from my mouth into your ears. And then that noise gets translated into something that you understand. It's a rational process. By the way, this is Augustine's explanation for how the Trinity is three and one at the same time. It's in my mind. It's in my mouth. It goes in your ear. It's in your mind. At the same time, the word which was in my mind is now also in your mind. So that when the word becomes flesh, God stays God while being a man. It's just an illustration of the Trinity. It's a very interesting one. It's actually quite powerful. It also says something about the way in which a, a human identity is forged through language, and but connected with reasoning as well. I can use words which you will understand, but what you will think are wrong. And the rectitude or falsehood of the words will be dependent on whether it's logical. So if, so if I say war is peace, Hopefully, you'll say nonsense. Or 2 plus 2 equals 5. You'll hopefully say nonsense. That makes no sense if that's true. You understood the words, but the words didn't fit with reasoning. And if reasoning doesn't hold, then it's impossible to think. Aristotle's three laws of logic law of identification, law of non-contradiction, law of the excluded middle. Three laws of logic. If, it, if, if reasoning does not hold, then we can't even talk and communicate. We're just making noises. We might as well be cats and dogs. But the new speak is going to do exactly that. It's going to change the, the reality through language, through a poli politics politicization of words so that people now will say exactly what they're told to say and more to the point will think that that's the way it is because the party says so. And one of the things the party does in 1984 is it starts to destroy all the old newspapers and archives and records. and produces new documents that the party puts out. So there's not literally no trace. There's no memory. All the people who lived at that point were dead. There's no historical records of what happened. And so if you rewrite the history from the Ministry of Truth to say that this is what happened, how would people know any different? They'll simply accept it. So it's an appeal to authority, not an appeal to truth. The truth is what the authority says. That's the whole, that's the end game. And the new la language, by the way, will be exponentially shorter, briefer than the old language. Did you know that about 40, 50 years ago, the average person's vocabulary was about, well, you can look this up on the internet probably, well, might even tell you something true that the average person's vocabulary was much larger than the average person's is today. Much larger. They'd play Scrabble and they'd look words up in a dictionary in which words that which they knew. They didn't tend to use them, but they knew the words. And the words were, so it wasn't a, an active vocabulary, but it was passive. They understood what the words meant. Nowadays, most people that I meet don't even, their vocabulary is about this small. The, the worst form is sports commentators. I can't stand it. It's so bad. I love sports. I cannot stand to listen to them. These guys are dumb on steroids. Steroid, steroids are not, you're not allowed to use steroids in athletics, but the, uh, but the commentators have intelligence that's dumb on steroids. It's so bad. It's not actually that they're stupid, but the language of sports is so dumb. Anyway, my wife says to me, how can you listen to that? And I said, I don't know. I guess I just, I really love the sports. But these guys, I have to turn the commentary off. Anyway, um, but, so the language is shorter and it will be void, and this is very interesting, it's void of emotion or imagery. Those things get removed. Everything emotive, everything that relates to goodness or a sense of goodness or beauty has to be removed because that will suggest a greater reality than the party. 
it will suggest God. And this is an atheistic state. Nothing that will suggest a greater good than what the party says is good can be allowed to re remain in, in the vocabulary of Newspeak. Now, C.S. Lewis in his work, The Abolition of Man, I've mentioned this last class or a few classes ago, says that this is what the modern education system does is it gets rid of predications of value like goodness and beauty. It gets rid of them and says they're subjective, they're not true. We're, we're only interested in truth and when we say this is beautiful or this is good, we just mean that we feel that way about it but not that, that it's actually so. And thereby it does, it moves language in the direction of newspeak is what I'm saying. I'm connecting the two books here. So in the place of old synonyms like good and bad, uh, all synonyms of good and bad, those are antonyms, uh, we will have um, the very word bad won't exist anymore. There'll be no word that for bad. And what we will get is uh, words like good and ungood. Good and ungood, not good and bad but good and ungood. And if you want to say it's very good, you'll have to say it's double plus good. But there's no binary reality anymore. There's no evil and good. We're beyond good and evil. It's good and ungood. Definitions in terms of one thing, not two things, not opposites, not truth and falsehood. There's good or there's true and there's untrue, but not true and false. If it was false, the party could be proved wrong. We can't have that. So it starts, the politics of the English language, Orwell writes this as well. I guess I'm out of time here. We'll see you next time, but I wanted to give you just a foundation today.